Hello, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of Vagabond Dog Industry Chats. Uh, this week, we've got Greg from Supergiant Games, uh, creators of, let's see if I can get an order, Bastion, Transistor, Pyre, and as we all been, we've been playing almost every morning here, uh, Hades, such a, which is a ton of fun. And if you haven't been catching the streams, I will try my best to summarize the game right now. It is a roguelike... Uh, Beat 'em up brawler adventure uh, action adventure game, uh, based in Greek mythology, where you play the son of Hades trying to escape, um, from the underworld, and uh, well, I don't want to get into too much of the story because it's a lot of that's a big hook of the game is is slowly uncovering, um, the characters of the game, uh, the uh, story of 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 the gods and. Uh, and learning all there is to learn about the mythology. Um, Greg, welcome to the show. Thank you for coming on. Yeah, thanks a lot for having me. And good good to talk to you again. Yes. We were talking uh, briefly before the show. It's, it's been a while. It has been a while. Um, if uh, and, and for for proof of, of our, our, our way back when-ness, I still have my OG Bastion oh, cool. <laughs> soundtrack yeah. signed by Darren from... Uh, from 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 I think one of the er earliest packs as I was gone. Yeah, to. must be a pax. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, man. It's so so like uh, to give a little bit of of uh, catch up. We 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 met at pax like uh, uh, the the very first time you guys showed off Bastion. I think. Um, was it was it that long ago? Yeah, because that that was that would be back in uh, pax. What was then called pax prime in yeah. in twenty ten. Yeah. Um, was when we showed Bastion as. Uh, part of what was called the PAX 10 they they would select uh, a few it was like a contest essentially like small uh, independent creators could submit their game um, and then they would kind of hand pick 10 of those submissions and say you get to exhibit your game at PAX uh, you know for free which if you're a small independent developer that's a big deal you could not necessarily afford uh, to be an exhibitor uh, at PAX uh, so yeah we hauled uh, we, we drove up to Seattle uh, which is like a 17, 18 hour drive from uh, the the San Francisco Bay Area where we're located um, and showed Bastion for the first time. And it was it, it was a, those of us who were there. Um, it was a really, really memorable experience for us because people like the game um, and yeah. it kind of like set our story in motion, I think. Yeah. On out. And yeah, I guess that's where we met, where we met way back when. Way back when. Yeah. And so, so you yeah, you've been you've been with Supergiant since since the beginning. Uh uh, as, a, as a writer and as a designer um, on all, all of the games and uh, a, a very important figure with the studio. And one of the things, we'll, we'll get into Hades in a little bit, but I want to talk about like being part of a studio like Supergiant. You know, um, it is an incredible group of, of, of talented individuals. You have a lot of really remarkable people who produce top tier work um, and I want to talk about what it's like to have a dedicated team that you've, you've worked with for so long, because you've, you've had the same people, um, you've grown for sure. New people have come in, but you have grown over the years. And I want to, I want to get a bit of a sense what it's like working with the same group for such a long period. Yeah, it's been, um, you know, it seems like everything these days, it both feels like a long time and it goes by in a flash, all of, like, depending on how I look at it. Um, cause yeah, we have been, um, we've been working together for more than 10 years now and we're, um, and all seven of the original members of the Bastion team, we're all still together in our respective roles. Um, so we've grown to about 19 people now. Um, actually a lot of that growth was, was on Hades. So we grew from seven to 12, uh, after Bastion and we stayed 12, uh, basically for like six years or more all through Transistor and all through Pyre. And then with Hades, um, since we decided to make an early access game and we wanted to like launch the first version of the game uh, quite quickly, a part of that meant uh, growing so that we could even just achieve that and just so that we could kind of shore up some, some of our weaknesses. Uh, but, you know, 19 people isn't uh, that small for, for like an independent studio, but it's still, I think, on the relatively smaller side, and that's been really core uh, to how mm -hmm. we work. I think like we've just all, we like to kind of work fast and, and, um, 
when you're small, the communication overhead isn't that high. Like if, you know, some of us, myself included, come from having worked at places like Electronic Arts, where it's like a company of thousands of people. Right. And when you make a decision there, you know, it's a big, complicated thing to propagate that decision, you know, across the organization, that sort of thing. But when, when it's a small group of people, you just you just tell each other, right? You, you like yeah. get in a room and you talk through things. But like, um, you know, it like it's been it's it's really been interesting for us i guess because we did start as kind of this uh it's incorrect to say like a garage shop because technically we were in a living room rather than a garage uh, when we first started but like uh you know it was very much uh, the startup life um in bastion in the bastion days where um amir and gavin the co-founders of supergiant they were uh they were like living in the same house where they were working um and um you know over time we we've tried to make it something more sustainable that that could be part of our part of our lives rather than just kind of like completely uh, dominate our lives as can happen when it's uh, more of the kind of startup mindset um it's still like i for me personally at least it's still like like it's never it feels like it's never gotten any easier mm -hmm. um but um we've I think we have found strategies to make the work kind of like fit in with our lives and how our lives have evolved. Like, you know, when, when we were starting, uh, a lot of my colleagues are kind of in their earlier twenties, something like that. Now, you know, 10 years later, it's a lot of, it's a big difference in life yeah. be, it going from, you know, your early to mid twenties to, to 10 years from there, you know, more folks have families or other responsibilities and, and things like that. And, you know, life, life changes and life moves on. So finding ways to where we can continue to make games together kind of in spite of, uh, or alongside of whatever kind of life throws at us, uh, has been one of our goals. And, and we, um, you know, I, I think we're, we're glad that we've been able to keep it going this long. And I think, you know, I, I can't relate to this personally as much, but, uh, Darren Korb, our audio director, obviously he, he's a, experienced musician and he's been in bands together with a mirror so i think they've always kind of had a bit of a band analogy in their minds because i think at a lot of game studios you know they like bigger game studios naturally they like people cycle in and out of them right. when, when when you're a certain size it's just naturally going to happen and small studios uh struggle to survive like they don't necessarily last uh for 10 years right. whether they like it or not so for us, the idea of like being able to stick together as a small group uh, for a long period of time and keep doing stuff that is interesting to us, that's really appealing. And, and some of our best analogies are our bands. Like you have the, I, I think of like New Order or something like that. They were just like kids in, in the seventies or something in the Joy Division days. And like, they're still, you know, making music or whatever, like decades later, um, having gone through a lot. So those, those kind of stories of bands that have, stuck together and kept doing interesting stuff i think are very inspiring to us and there are not too many stories like that in game development but there are some um i think of a it's a bit of a tangent but i the, the 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 three like the creators of dragon quest it's three three guys uh like including akira toriyama who is like the dragon ball yeah. z creator and stuff like yeah. that it's like those guys I didn't realize this until somewhat recently. Like they've worked together on every right. Dragon Quest game, like since the '80s, for more than 30 years now. Um, those same three guys. So that to me is like I, I think you can't top that as far as like a small group of creators, Just like sticking really it, sticking yeah. it out over a really long period of time. But um, so yeah, if we can, if we can last another five or ten or 20 years, I think that would be amazing. Um, we just kind of want to see how long we can go for but we we you know we've learned to work with each other um we're, we're learning all the time like we all have our idiosyncrasies as people um and it's and i think one of the one of the advantages that again like a small close-knit team can have is that you just kind of play to your strengths more and more you you kind of work around you don't have to make everyone kind of conform to a certain way of working you can just right let people work in the way that they they can do their do their best and and have the most flexibility with the rest of their lives and and i think that's worked out uh, well for us over time it's just uh, having that 
like allowing that for for everyone on an individual level. Yeah, it it is very clear that there are um, very strong artistic personalities, and I don't mean like the, the character. I mean like the the personality of the artwork, right? Darren's music is always recognizable. Uh, Jen's artwork is always yeah. recognizable. Um, I, I mean, I can't say that Gavin and uh, Gavin and Andrew's engineering work is always visibly recognizable, but the the for, the formula is there for sure. Um, uh, I I want I want to ask more. Like, what? It, yeah. Did you always intend uh, as a group to to stick together for so long? We we wanted to, but like you know, it's one of those things where intend is a. It's easy to like retcon and right. say like, oh yeah, we you know we knew like like I. The more honest answer is. Um, I've approached every single game I've worked on at Supergiant uh, fully expecting the very real likelihood that it may well be my last. Uh, Bastion, I figured, may be my first and last game. Transistor, maybe my, you know, my last game. Pyre, maybe my last game. Now Hades. Every every time, like when we're in the thick of production, I'm like, well, maybe this is it. I don't know that we'll have another shot after this for one reason or another. I don't know if I'll personally have another shot. Uh, one way or another so let me just do my damnedest on this one because if i'm gonna if this is gonna be my last one i want it to be i want it to be worthwhile right. like i care about it in that way because you never i mean like who knows like like look mm -hmm. at this year right like you don't know what life is going to throw at you um even if everything goes perfectly on the development front you don't know what's going to happen uh, elsewhere and when we have this group of people like, like we've been we've been very fortunate that, that we've been able to stick together because it's more than just it's more than just our ability to make games together right it's it's everything else in life that that people uh, that that you know by by good fortune we've been able to keep keep working because stuff happens you know people have to move on sometimes circumstantially mm -hmm. you know not even because they want to or whatever whatever happens so we we have i think we have consciously wanted to be like a sustainable place to work where we could in theory um you know th th that this could be the last job we ever have that yeah, like yeah. Th th this is our this is our career we could look back on it you know with fondness hopefully but you know it's it's wishful thinking until you do it right like just because we want that to happen it doesn't mean that's how it's going to pan out um so yeah i you hear the way i'm talking about it i just like try never i try never to take it for granted i just feel it, it's a good motivator um mm -hmm. it, it it helps motivate me to to do my best like knowing that some of the things that you mentioned it's like that i get to work with people like darren and jen you know they they just my work is enhanced so much just by being in the proximity of their work like for example so i think we just all kind of recognize that we have this kind of unique a combination of factors to where you know all of our work just is is elevated by working together like we've all done stuff individually also but we haven't achieved the kind of success as individual creators as we have working together we have to like recognize that so there, sure. there's some there's some magic there and we want to kind of keep it keep it going you yeah get that, you get that megazord factor yeah, exactly. <laughs> that is a very good way to put it. Gen Z would strongly approve of, of that uh, um, characterization of it. I mean, so so I mean, I, I absolutely can see where the um, assumption that, you know, this could be our last game absolutely plays a part in creating high quality content. You know, you're really always going to give it your all. But when, with with that sort of mentality also, like, um, I mean, can you can you talk a bit about like how do you retain such high talent? Um, you know, if for for so many people, like it's a big group, um, seven and then twelve and then and then nineteen. Yeah. Um, you know, how do how is it just the company culture? Is it is it really good contracts? Is it, um, you know, how do you not only produce that sustainable environment but convey it to everybody and 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 breed a culture that like sort of fits that uh, intention? I guess. Yeah, I mean, uh, I mean, you know, growing is growing for me is super scary, right? Because yeah, like when we after after Bastion, we had this team of seven. We um, and Bastion turned out really well for us. It was scary to add people because even if, for me, it's like I think about how even if you add the best person in the world um, in some in some discipline, who may you know not only. Are they the most talented person in the world? They they also have the best personality. Right. It's still gonna like 
it's still going to change things. Um, and, and you don't know how it will sort of disrupt the other chemistry on the team. So for me, that's like, it should be a source of excitement, but I, I, I'm sort of like, I can be a fearful person in some ways, I guess. Um, so for me, it's like, oh, you know, what if, what if these like important little team dynamics that we have are sort of thrown off, but it hasn't, it, my, my fears about that really have not like have been unfounded because we've been, um, we've been careful in who we brought on board. Um, and we look for people to, we, we've, I, I think we've embraced the part where like, we actually don't, the, the goal of bringing people on is that we don't want things to be exactly the same. We want to grow like, like the culture should grow along with the team. It's not like, you're not trying to like preserve the culture exactly by, because someone who joins you should, should be, should be broadening right. your culture in some way. Right. Um, but, but, you know, at the same time you have your, you have your values and values is like a funny thing, you know, values is one of those like cor super like corporate sounding things and right. in fact we we like we bristled at it um forever but after pyre um at the start of hades we like articulated our our values for the first time and it was partly because we were about to like grow and we're like what do we what do we even want like because you know what i want may be different from what jen wants maybe different from what Darren wants. Like we kind of talk around it all the time. Let's, let's get it out there. What do we actually want? What, what is the common ground between us? Let's not assume uh, too much about those things and actually try and try and spell it out. And we did, uh, we did actually articulate those, like in part, we kind of needed that because mm -hmm. when, when people join, like, what do we tell them? What do we tell them that we're about? What do we tell them that, that we care about? We can't just assume, you know, they don't have that context of having worked with us for 10 years. So, so those are some of the motivating factors for like, um, to like doing some of that soul searching. And I think it's been really, it's been really helpful because I think that the values that we have, they, they help when people are starting with us and, and they help us like through, like during the, you know, to have real values, they, they you, you kind of have to, sometimes they have to be called into conflict. You have to find yourself in situations where you're like, where you have to look back at them and, and to help you make the right decision because because the easy decision and the right decision are often at right. odds um so we you know i think we've brought on super talented people and we've grown you know pretty carefully um it is like as a percentage it's you know it's more than twice our original size but it's also been more than 10 years mm -hmm. um so it's it's been pretty, like I would describe it as like very deliberate uh, growth in specific areas um, to enable what what we've done. And then I I think just having the same people in their respective roles over a long period of time has helped ensure that um, our our standards such as they are have remained, you know, somewhat intact. Right? It's still like, you know, if if Darren is making our music and doing our audio, it's like. I think it's reasonable to expect a certain level of quality in that regard, for example, or, you know, for as long as Gen Z is our art director, um, I'm, I'm not, I, I, I will always look forward to, you know, whatever the art direction on our games right. is going to be things like that. So, uh, you, you know, the, um, the stability of our team, I think has been an important factor in, in all that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's clear. It's it's very clear. Like you, you can tell a super giant game when you look at it because of that stability. I think. Um, but I want to go to, um, I guess the 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 start of Hades, and and Chad is yeah. Chad is very excited. You're here. <laughs> um, the uh, uh, where did this game start? Uh, what were the inspirations for? It? Um, and what was that aha moment that like one decided you were gonna, this is the game you guys want to do, and to that it's worth growing the company for considering that you guys aren't a group that grows for the sake of growing. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, you know, the, there were like, um, each of our games has been um, a response to the, to the previous game in some respects and like the, the experience of making it. Um, so each of our games has started in a different way. Um, and the thing on on Hades that was really different from how uh, we started our previous projects was that in a word we we planned it um, it's something we've never done 
in the past. Um, we we decided to spend more time like up front deciding what the game was going to be. And and similar to the kind of values thing I was talking about before, that's something that in the past has felt very taboo for our team because we we know we know that paper design is kind of like mm-hmm. it's it's not worth too much more than like toilet paper because you could design all you want on paper, but yeah. when when the when the rubber meets the road, that's kind of the real thing, and and your design is very likely to change an awful lot once you like actually implement it and start testing it. So we've avoided um, our games have never had design documents at any point, and that's again like possible because our team is small. Um, but with Hades, we're like, hey, let's at least identify what we're going for because for our last two projects. We've spent a lot of time kind of wandering in the woods, um, redoing this and that, not really knowing where we're going, and and that actually, for you know, you may you may think that my, my title is creative director. You may think that I'm the one, you know, I want to wander in the woods and not know where I'm going, but I I'm actually kind of of the opposite. I, for me personally, ideas come fairly in a fairly concrete way. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm more drawn to just choosing um, at least broadly an idea and then and then trying to fulfill it um, and not not kind of turning back because no idea is perfect um, and and it's just important I think to if an idea is exciting to you then you explore it and you see it through um, to to be a bit reductive I guess but um, so with Hades you know. The first thing is that we we plan uh, like we wanted to plan it more. We also, as part of that, we started to um, as part of the values exercise and everything, we started to outline like certain priorities that we had, like in, in talking through different ideas for what our next game could be. Certain themes started to emerge, and we and we started to document those. It's like, what do we actually want here? And one of the things that emerged from that is the idea that we wanted to kind of change our whole development process because similar to like the the wandering in the woods um our games you know for much of development can be in like a kind of a barely playable state and then we have to you know we have these uh, periods of time where we have to pull everything together and make everything work and um and gavin you know uh who's who's our development director really like wanted to come up with like a more disciplined uh, development process where our games could be like in a in a shippable, playable state for for more of development. Totally reasonable thing. It's hard to argue mm-hmm. with that as a goal. So basically, the first thing we decided was um, to make an early access game. Right. Before we had any idea of the genre or the theme, we're like, let's try early access um, it, because it would let us test our idea sooner, and it would and it would basically force us to um, to have a more disciplined development approach because we would be kind of like building the game in these in, in like update by update and we'd have to like ship every update so instead of like shipping one thing every three years we'd ship stuff you know every couple of months mm-hmm. um and and that was that was both scary and appealing and we like the combination of scary and appealing um like pushing our, ourselves out of our creative comfort zone and so on um so then flowing from uh the early access decision is the decision to make like a highly replayable game Mm-hmm. And we we decided to make a, a roguelike game because we're play. I I and some of my colleagues love games in that genre. We we're playing a lot of them, like Dead Cells and Slay the Spire and stuff like that, and many others. Um, and we thought that while we didn't think that we could necessarily compete pound for pound with those games, like Dead Cells is like, oh my god, this game's amazing. We felt that we did have something that we could like at least add to, like give our game a reason to exist uh, through our approach uh, to narrative. We felt like we could give this genre like more narrative context yeah. than it's known for um and that's actually very similar to what we did with action rpgs on on bastion where we're like well we're not going to make a, a strictly better action rpg than like diablo 2 but we can explore storytelling within this genre which isn't really something that we've seen done a lot before uh, so very similar uh, mindset going into hades and and also just like in in some ways a return like a return to those bastion roots in, in in other ways as well of wanting to make a game that felt very like immediate uh very approachable um but that would reveal its depth of uh, kind of the more you played uh because 
one of the things that was concerning to me personally in my role was was this sense that our games were becoming more kind of in a word like esoteric uh, over time which was never which is not a deliberate goal we we want our games to be to be highly approachable mm -hmm. and to create these like to be able to create meaningful experiences for people but i i just don't think that like the the approachability of a game and its ability to leave you with a lasting and positive Im impression those things are not in conflict like you don't have to make games that are like highfalutin to have them right. have artistic merit like those th so so i i i was for me it was something i felt strongly about and i was worried that um you know transistor was a little less approachable than bastion and pyre was a little less approachable than transistor and i'm like where is this where is this path going are we just going to make like increasingly narrow games over time and, yeah. and it's a bit unfair to us because people like this is not i i love those i i poured my blood sweat and tears into those games i i love them dearly uh, but um but like i said i i don't want them to i don't want people to feel like they they need to like do a bunch of homework before they yeah. can enjoy one of our games or that that our games like went over people's heads or something like that like it's not that's not really my style um and and i i liked that bastion had this veneer of being just this kind of like oh it's this cool little arcade game that's cute and then you play it and then and then you discover that there's more to it i i like that quality a lot um where where our games are more than what they seem right. so I, I i was personally quite interested in going back to that with with hades and and then the idea of like a basing it in greek myth partly flowed from that it's like highly um if we're gonna make like we knew our game was going to be weird no matter what because we can't help but make our stuff a little bit weird so we're like well at least the greek gods provide provide like some some right. kind of like very familiar affordances right like <clears throat> if we're going to make a roguelike dungeon crawler who better than like zeus and poseidon to give you your abilities because you know right away zeus is going to give you lightning stuff Poseidon's going to give you water stuff and it just like as a player it it helps you feel grounded in that world instead of like feeling totally bewildered um in a really uncomfortable way um and and i mean more importantly i i lo like i i've loved greek myth since i was a little kid i was surprised and delighted to discover a number of my colleagues were also like longtime fans of it and were like oh cool we've never we've never done an adaptation before that's actually yeah. and i find that a bit ironic actually because we're so we're so fortunate to have been able to make like original games each time so to us the idea of an adaptation was actually more of a creative challenge than just make something up totally from scratch because we've we've done that several times we know what that's like but we've never had to like work with an existing uh, mythology um and and try and put our own uh spin on it so that um yeah long answer but that's that's kind of the the genesis of, of the where, project where Hades started. i mean it's it's yeah. really clear to see how like adapting greek myth would absolutely hit that accessibility uh checkbox because i mean yeah it like like i mean as you found in your team you know it, it's a common ground but i'm it's a common ground for a lot of us like you know right. everybody's grown up with at least some interaction uh with the mythology <clears throat> um uh, in in dealing with the the mythos as a writer uh i i'm curious how you personally felt about um you know the the original create creating original works versus the adaptive work so how did it change your process um and and what did you enjoy more about it enjoy less about it what was the what was the yeah. experience like for you no as a it, yeah it was really i mean it was a really interesting experience uh for for sure i i've been really um i've been really fortunate to have had like kind of uniquely different writing challenges with each of the games that we've worked on um, um, in some respects, Hades picks right up where Pyre leaves off, and it, it, you know, to to the earlier point I was making, like Hades would never have existed if not for Pyre. And uh, specifically on the narrative side of things, we just kind of picked right up where that game left off. We really enjoyed making a game with a big cast of characters, mm -hmm. um, and and it got good feedback in that regard. And having like basically a in some respects a highly like um, a highly reactive story 
that that responded to the specifics of a player's uh, decisions over time. So we we kind of fully embraced that approach from the beginning on Hades. Um, but in terms of the in terms of the like the subject matter itself, you know, if we the Greek myth on the one hand it, it has that approachability, but it's a double edged sword too because. You hear that something's an adaptation of Greek myth. I don't know about you, but I roll my eyes. It's like, dude, it's been done. It's been done a million times. Who cares? Like, mm -hmm. what is this going to do that hasn't been done before? So in some respects, we had to have, like, enough sort of audacity to think that we, like, had a reason. Like, what could we contribute to this? Do we really honestly think that we can, like, make a work in Greek myth that, like, deserved to exist that, like, like hasn't really been done before? And it's like, well... Yeah, maybe, like, maybe, because there's this one angle that seems really obvious, and yet I, I don't really see it being done, which is uh, the, the, the recognition that the Olympians are a big, the ultimate big dysfunctional family. Like, mm -hmm. what makes them compel, it's like my hypothesis, it's like, the reason we still remember the Olympian gods thousands of years later isn't because they have sick lightning and water powers. It's because we kind of see ourselves in them, and they're they're a big messed up family, and yeah. and the idea is, you know, to me, what's so compelling is this idea that like, if the gods are so messed up, then well, we maybe we can be a little bit more forgiving of ourselves. Like, what hope do we have of being perfect if even the gods are these total uh, garbage right. fires, basically? <laughs> um, so, the like exploring their their vulnerabilities and their and their flaws and their humanity like through the lens of this kind of like family drama comedy felt it's like well n no i haven't really seen something like that done before and and also and and part of it is that we wanted to or i personally wanted very much to draw from the original sources like i i feel like a lot of things based on greek myth they're like inspired by other modern media based on greek myth rather than the source material if that makes sense mm -hmm. like uh, something like clash of the titans you know is very influential but i think a lot of what's so fascinating about these characters is right there in the source material um and and the characters are much more complicated in general in the source material and like over time some of these characters like zeus i feel like he gets conflated with like biblical capital g god as like this benevolent patriarch but like in the source material, <laughs> Zeus Zeus is like the most messed up one out of all of them, like by a long shot. So it's like, how did this happen that he gets that he gets to be portrayed as this kind of like happy go lucky guy in you know Disney's Hercules or something like that? Right. When when in the source material he is uh, he is someone with completely unchecked power who is happy to exploit that power every step of the way. So. So yeah, drawing drawing from the source material was was really fascinating to me, and and just having a point of view on it that was specific while still trying to be true to the source material, like was uh, really to me it felt like a clear uh, goal. But the the you know of course the specifics of the execution, uh, especially considering like the the particular details of our of our narrative structure and everything certainly had its challenges. And it was a high volume of writing content over time, but I had a ton of fun. Like I loved, um, I loved writing this game. I've never felt like sort of more efficient as a writer than working on this game. Like by comparison, working on Transistor, whose script is like a small fraction of the script of Hades. It was so painstaking. Like I would, I would, you know, rewriting is a big part of writing. You have to iterate on your work, but, there could be iteration to a point where you, you feel like you've lost sight of the goal and you're just kind of spinning your wheels. And sometimes I would rewrite sentences on transistor, you know, over a dozen times um, and stuff like that. Um, whereas on, on Hades, it just came, uh, it, it felt, it felt more, I felt more kind of in my element and, and part of it, like, like the early access process actually really helped Um surprisingly even and even with regard to the story where it, it just started getting like people just liked what we were doing with it and that emboldened me and the rest of us to just kind of keep going whereas i think left to our own devices we would have second guessed like a lot more of it um which we've done you know on every other uh, project in the past but 
early access, you know, people like these characters are like, sweet, give me more. It's like, awesome. If you like it, that's great. Uh, happy to happy to do more with this. Yeah, so. It, it is a, a, a tremendous cast of characters, not just the gods, but like all, all of the uh, side players um, that come into play. Uh, you know, there's, and I appreciate that you recognize the, uh, because it comes across in the game, the modernity of of the characters or the of the modernity of the adaptations um uh we all loved so many of the characters chat really loved some of the characters in particular yeah. um and uh it, it just it just works really really well it flows there's a lot of personality in each of them um and and i think it's it's like you said you know um a lot of that comes from uh, recognizing traits in ourselves in people we know rec reflected in, in, yeah. in these in these people but i'm 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 fascinated to talk about the uh, volume of writing in this game because yeah. <laughs> that um as a fellow writer is something that is 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 really personal to me um uh specifically i want to talk about like so i i played through the game the first time um expecting uh, 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 to to get everything out, you know, by the time I beat it, you know, yeah. that, that there was this one, you know, like here I win, yep. I I am I'm victorious, but it's like ripped away from you, uh, and you know, you really it it digs into that um uh roguelike early access experience where it's like okay, play the enjoy the gameplay more, um, mm -hmm. and and the the story is there as 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 reward. Um, and as a treat um, for 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 the progress, um, I want to know how you feel about that process, um, and how do you feel about the balance between um, the infinite nature of a game, a roguelike game, um, versus the tradition of here's a satisfying ending that you're guaranteed to get, um, you know, every, for, for every yeah. player, you know, as yeah. a, as a storyteller. Yeah, absolutely. That that was like a, um, you know, finding that balance was a really important part of the process uh, for for me and for, for all of us. Um, and we, um, it was a really interesting kind of riddle to try and solve of like, well, how much story do you put into a game that can be played uh, infinitely? Um, ideally, the answer is you put in infinite story. But uh, the nature of the way we tell the story is uh, someone does have to craft it. It can't just be procedurally generated the same way as the encounters can. So then the question is still like, well, how much do you, how much do you reasonably put in? And for me, like the reason why there's a lot is kind of twofold. One is uh, really, and maybe this sounds odd. It's like for the characters themselves. Um, I, I love um, the characters I work with. And when I'm writing, I feel like I become kind of their emissary. They are alive um, to me. And I am just responsible for like communicating what they would, what they have to say in a given situation. But they're, they're just telling me the stuff and I, and I report it. Um, it's funny. I used to be a, used to work in the press. So it almost feels weirdly like reporting. Full circle. Um, but um the and and so to make characters feel alive i want to avoid the moment that happens in a lot of games where a character runs out of stuff to say and yeah. you're like and and it's a moment that we all totally accept it's not like a big deal and tons of really high you know zelda breath of the wild or whatever like the the best rated games of all time all have this moment where you like hit the A button one too many times on a character and they repeat their last line, you're like, okay, there's no more. You move on and it's okay. But for me personally, when I have that moment in games, like it breaks my immersion just a little bit and mm -hmm. I see the seams of the game and it's like, well, that's, it's an aspect of games that's not like true to life. Um, not that games, games don't have to be true to life, but like it's, it, it's something that makes me, that makes the the seams of the development kind of show through for me um so we i wanted to avoid this the scenario for as long as possible that a character would start to repeat themselves because un, if they don't repeat themselves they seem more alive and if they react to things that you would expect them to react to in the context of the world they seem more alive so 
the content volume was like a means to an end um, from that point of view. And we just kind of chipped away at it. Like we didn't, I don't know. Uh, like I only became truly aware of the the volume of content like after the this version 1.0 shipped because during early access, our players kind of ate it up. You know, update by update, mm -hmm. we would add more story, um, and players would be like, "Oh, cool, there's more stuff for this character or whatever." But they'd kind of devour it, um, and I I would almost liken it to like an to like an MMO, like a World of Warcraft. Right. Like it doesn't matter how much content you put in, people are going to devour it, and there's never enough. Uh, but um, it did turn out that you know when we when we launched version 1.0 i think i think the the general consensus was like oh cool there's a lot of content and it's like oh wow we actually i can't believe we succeeded at that like i i'm i'm more accustomed to players saying you know that they they wish that there was even more and to be clear they do say that about Hades as well um so, and in other ways never um, but but uh, yeah um, well i mean it, it's like it's a way of paying a compliment right yeah. it's like if you like something you're like yeah can't wait for the next one or can't wait till there's more um but um, yeah yeah i think i uh, hopefully that that uh answers it as to where some of the yeah it's just turned out to be a lot um i guess for that reason yeah i'm I'm very familiar with the um the that problem you have with, cre with in creating where it's like i don't want the the content to loop ever i yeah. don't want the player to see the same things twice it's why i find myself writing 15 different text boxes for interacting with a garbage can that players are exactly. in 95 percent probability going to hit once however but where i have um uh, because i'm exclusively text right i have the freedom to just shotgun yeah. content in it like crazy you have so much voice acting in this game. It it's it's unfathomable to me how you could have so much content and have it all voice acted. Well, that was the big jump from Pyre because Pyre was all was was mostly yeah. text driven. Um, and I I kind of approached it the way that you described of like wanting there to be um like a high amount of specificity and like well it's text only so i could just do most of this you know on my on my own like if i add if i had a bunch of text stuff it's not really affecting um other folks on team you know directly because there there's still like a testing cost i guess to any uh new piece of content added but overall i i can kind of one stop shop you know enhance the story uh, or build upon the story but in uh yeah in Hades we made the uh, decision to fully voice the game that was one of those things i i was very um that's another thing that i pushed hard for myself i i felt very um fired up about it and wanted to prove that we could do it and we did early prototypes uh where um we demonstrated it like what, one of the really big it, it's funny no one really notices this but to me it's like a huge deal with respect to our past games but this is our first game with like a voiced protagonist like our previous games all basically right. have like a silent protagonist type of character and i think i think like a voice protagonist is really really tricky because if they have like if they have a lot of personality then you could get into those situations where the character is kind of acting like a jackass or something like, like like where the character it creates these dissonant moments where you as a player are like kind of reject how the character is behaving or what the character is doing i, I think those moments are really risky in games they could be really off-putting if the character isn't like executed well uh, so it's kind of like how much personality does this character have or are they just a a cipher for the player or you know uh, do they have a strong personality where on, on that scale are you so we um we tried versions of hades that didn't have a speaking protagonist that you, you would just walk up to achilles and you know achilles would say something but your character was silent and like uh it felt wrong um I, I knew it would feel wrong, but I wanted to demonstrate, you, prove it. <laughs> you know, the, the way in which it would feel wrong. And then, um, so we started fully voicing everything, but again, it's one of those things where like, I think if we knew how much work it was going to be up front, we probably <laughs> would, would have like right. talked ourselves out of it or something, but uh, by chipping away at it over time, um, we kind of lost sight of the, the sheer volume of it. And we just got into a real rhythm with it. Um, uh, Darren Korb, uh, did uh, all of the voice recording, so he was very much my kind of partner in crime uh, on the project. Um, he's an awesome voice director. Uh, really, he, he and and he voices uh, Zagreus and Skelly as well. For those familiar with that character, and he does all our music and sound effects. So he's like, I mean, I have no words for Darren's talent. 
um, the the part where he ended up voicing Zagreus, uh, that's kind of a story in itself. That was not something that we initially expected, but I, I as soon as I heard his audition, I was like, dude, Jaren's like, oh, you know, like maybe you just throw this in as scratch, kind of like temporary voiceover. I'm like, dude, like this is it. This is like what we've been looking for. He's like, oh, you know, well, we could try it. And I'm, I, I felt from the moment I heard it that that was it. And we kind of like agreed to try it and it it totally just stuck. He 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 nailed the character. And there was a huge advantage to him being the one uh to do it. Because again, like if we you know, if we got um um like some famous um to- uh, we, we talked about like Tom Hiddleston or something like that. It was like someone who's the the kind of vibe we were going for with Zagreus. If we actually cast literal Tom Hiddleston as Zagreus, I don't think the game would have turned out as well because we would have had, you know, two or three recording sessions. Right. uh, And that would be it. But with Darren, we're recording constantly. Um, And this is, again, back to our approach with with Bastion, where uh, and Logan Cunningham is a huge part of this game as well, Mm -hmm. has been in all our games. But uh, with Logan Cunningham as the narrator in Bastion, we could just record frequently and often and record highly specific things uh, in reaction to like really kind of micro decisions and level design and and what have you. And similarly with Darren, you know, his ability to record uh, quickly and efficiently um, meant that we could get that much more kind of specific and have um, just even more content than than we would have otherwise. Um, So we just, that's kind of like, you know, a, a broader theme for us is like, we just try to make, games around the individuals that we have like we like the resources that we have you know are our our people like let's let's play to our best strengths so let's let's make games you know based on the ingredients that we can make the best um and we have this you know extraordinarily talented actor in logan this this amazing musician in darren this amazing art director in jen so you know it's it's only natural that our games try to play to their strengths and i think on on hades we just discovered even more of the certainly in darren just even more uh <laughs> of his seemingly limitless talent um yeah so that's that's how like the sheer volume of the voice over uh, ended up happening through through a lot of effort on his part was it was it all uh dev team members did you have outside people coming in for oh, voices oh yeah for sure it's only um only a few um the majority are well that was part of the challenge it's like a mix of actors we've worked with in the past but we also worked with actors we've never worked with uh, before and and a few voices on team um uh, you know logan uh who's been our principal uh voice talent in all our games he plays like six different characters uh in this game so he could shoulder a lot of it just uh, single-handedly but yeah, the the voice cast is quite big. We actually just released a video uh, today that where like every nice. member of the voice cast, you know, gets to say hello and uh, list the characters they play. So a lot of actors, you know, play at least two, if not more, uh, roles. Uh, but we, our our goal with each voice performance was like for the voice to just kind of perfectly match the characterization we were going for. And we, you know, if if two voices sounded too similar, we would we would cast a different actor. But if if actors had the capacity to like provide two really different sounding voices, we had no problem, you know, having them in multiple roles. And again, we we benefit from like when when we have that relationship, when it's someone we enjoy working with, it's like it's it's great if they can play multiple parts. It's more work for them. We like working with them. The result is good. Like we were, everybody's happy. Yeah. Yeah, I think it absolutely was the 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 right choice because uh, uh, playing playing Pyre and and Hades right next to each other this week, yeah, I absolutely noticed how oh, yeah. how much more accessible um, Hades became because of that factor. Yeah, um, it's it's weird. It's weird because it shouldn't. It like intellectually, it doesn't make sense why it should feel that different, but it really, really does. Mm-hmm. Um, it, it, like the, the full speech is just, yeah, in, in that goal of like making it more approachable, um, it, it did, it did a lot and, and we don't have, you know, we can't do like mass effect cutscenes or whatever, like metal gear cutscenes. So our, our presentation overall is not that different from Pyre. It's actually like 
less sophisticated in some ways. It's, you know, portrait in a text box, but the full speech just does so much work uh, yeah. in making these characters uh, come, come to life uh, for people. And we've been really, I, I know Darren, I know it means a lot to Darren, means a lot to me too, like seeing, seeing the, we didn't expect to see like praise for the, for the voice acting actually, because we knew, we know Darren, uh, we know uh, Logan Cunningham is an amazing actor and some of our other like um, members of our voice cast are really amazing, but some of us are, are amateurs compared to them. Mm -hmm. And the fact that like Darren, again, through, through his, um, through his voice direction was able to sort of like make, you know, the worst actors of the, the gap between the worst and the best. It's like close enough to where the general impression is that it's, it's all good. Like that, that was what, that was an important goal for us because we, yeah, we wanted, we wanted every character to stand out, but, um, we, we wanted to, um, yeah, we want, we wanted to work with actors that we've enjoyed working with in the past and, and all that stuff too. Yeah. So, so, so the full speech was definitely a really big, uh, kind of scary thing that we, that we, uh, took on with this game, mm -hmm. but, but one that we're, as you can tell, we, we were excited about also. Yeah. It's given, it's given me a lot of confidence because like as a, as a, as a significantly smaller developer, um, who loves to put poor content into my games, it's, it's, it's one of those things that has seemed wildly inaccessible, but now I kind of see a clearer path to like how yeah. it can be done. And, more so like i get hung up and, I'll, and i'm going to ask you a bit about this but like yeah. the the value of content and it getting buried in your game yeah yeah um and yeah I, the, how do you deal with that yeah the uh the one other thing first i'll say to to voice acting is like as a writer it's also a fun it's a fun exercise knowing that all your writing will be spoken because yeah. it 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 makes you like writing for people to say stuff is different from writing just straight up prose right like there there's a lot of stuff in in novels or whatever that like a human being would never would never say but making it um like going full speech it forces you uh or or invites you at least to to adopt like a more conversational style where like you have to imagine a human being actually having to say the crap that you're writing uh and and it's like a, i think it's a good it, it for me personally it helped keep it very grounded and helped keep it like flowing and conversational and all that i'd have to sound it out mm -hmm. uh that sort of thing so i really enjoyed uh that that aspect of it um the like uh sorry your your well, oh the your, uh the value of the oh the value of stuff getting buried and, it, and it yeah. getting buried yeah so you i've feel? you know i've made peace with this long ago where like there's a ton of so i actually have a spreadsheet that like has uh, voice lines and story events that are like the least encountered in the right, game. Right. And there's, there's uh, hundreds and hundreds of them uh, that are like, like 0.1% of players yeah. have encountered. And I think it's great. Like, I, I think it's great because it's for them. Right. That's how I reconcile it. It's not, it's not for all the people who who never like like if something has zero percent then i'm like oh there's a bug it just didn't work um but but if if one out of a hundred people or one out of a thousand people or one out, uh, like encountered a yeah. certain moment in the game i think i think there's like a probably a pretty strong correlation between that like like there's a good chance that that moment felt like special to that player in some way because it's probably so specific Mm -hmm. in some way that that only that that person is like whoa what like i can't believe that you know this like this character had this to say about this particular flow of events or that this character like acknowledged this really specific game state that i that that i know most players probably would not have been in um so i'm like for me it's part of the fun and again part of making the character like it, it's in service of the characters like I enjoy it from a play for the sake of players, but I enjoy it like out of respect to the characters themselves of like, well, they just would say this and this, this game is capable of creating this situation and the character needs to be able to say something here. If this situation comes up, I don't know if it will, but, but if it does, you know, if you play through a uh, Hades and never talk to Achilles until hour 50, after you've already finished the game, he has to introduce himself in a different way. Right. than if you talk to him the very first time you can like one of the uh, you know to me i think at least one of the interesting things about 
the story in Hades is that it's almost completely optional. Like you don't, mm -hmm. you don't have to talk to anybody uh, in the House of Hades almost at any point. Um, you you can, you can literally go through the entire game and never talk to Hades himself in the house. Ignore him for all we care. And yet he has you know mountains of, of like content or things to talk about. But I think part of, again, this is sort of reflecting on Pyre. It's it's really different as a player when you can opt in to the story than when the story is is put forth before you. Um, I think there's when the story is put forth before you, I think some players it can almost create like an antagonistic relationship where you're like there you know, I must bypass this story to then get to the gameplay. Mm -hmm. Something like that. And it's like a it's kind of it's it's troubling because that's like not what it's there for. It's there, you know, to be experienced and so on. But if the player is forced into it, I think I think sometimes they just don't like it. Um, so in Hades, you know, again, it's it's a bit back to the Bastion days of like, it's just optional. If you just want to blow off steam and go like kill some undead or whatever, knock yourself out. You could start playing in seconds and just go have fun, have a hack and slash action -y experience. And but if you want to engage more deeply these characters are there and they're happy to talk to you as much as you want to talk to them um and and i think that makes the interactions feel more personal and more special and and then and then the funny thing that happens is you know it seems so scary of like oh my god you put all these work into these characters and yet they're totally optional but like i think the reality is everybody talks to them it's yeah. not like people <laughs> i think in reality very few people actually have that experience of like ignoring uh, the story um but they can and knowing that they can i think it does like frame their relationship to the story in a different way and makes them more willing to like you know i am deciding to to, to engage with the story as opposed to the story is being uh, thrust upon me um and it feels really different in that way yeah it, it, it absolutely comes across more as a reward um to get these moments than uh than a lot of other games i've played um, the unskippable cutscene kind yeah, of problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, it, it's been uh, wonderful diving into this game. Uh, I really appreciate <laughs> your time tonight. Um, I, I'm I'm curious to for for a, a, to hear a bit about like what kind of risks do you want to take creatively going going forward uh, as a as a as a writer as a creative yeah. director. I mean, uh, like. I don't know if I think of I want to I want to keep I want to keep doing stuff that is hard for me. I, I don't know that I like think of it in exactly the in, in terms of risk, but I think I feel like any like fulfilling worthwhile creative pursuit uh, has risk integral to it. But the risk in and of itself is not it's like the pursuit is what I want, not, not, not the risk, right? The risk is like a necessary um, component of what makes something exciting and scary to work on. So yeah, like in this case, you know, adapting Greek mythology to me was, was scary. Like there are a lot of, I, it, it's kind of sacred to me. And I feel like there are a lot of um, like really significant works in the genre and also a lot of works that I, I don't think very highly of personally. It was like, ah, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to end up like that. And like, and, and, and it's a risk, you know, you set, you set foot into this space. Like you don't know where you're going to, where you're going to end up. Um, I mean, there are a lot of, like, it's, it's hard to answer this without getting more specific than I should also, but there, there are a lot of, there are a lot of types of stories I want to keep writing different characters. I, I don't want to, I've been really, really fortunate to get to work on like different settings and different character. I, I love writing characters like a lot. Uh, Pyre was the first time I got to like write dialogue, which sounds absurd, but like our previous games, oh, yeah. it's basically just monologuing. Um, but I, I love writing character interactions and writing character relationships and exploring different, different relationships uh, the way the way that people understand or don't understand one another um, that's infinitely interesting to me and I just want to keep working in different genres with different characters 
um, that on a, on a personal level, that's that would be great uh, for me. But I don't I don't know what what would you like? What would be your answer to like what risks um, do you want to take? I I always look for new ways um, of letting the player control it more. Yeah, taking, no, that's taking, cool. Taking that out of my hands, you know, uh, whether yeah. that means I have to flood the game with more content uh, and just add add infinity more variables, or I have to genuinely start devising new ways for narrative to be told. Yeah. I just I want to 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 take the risk that is going to allow the player to be in in greater control than than my my previous game yeah uh, so i relate to that a lot um the um i and i know i i i really feel what you're saying the um something that was really scary about this game and and it, it, it's part of why the the like warm reception was was somewhat shocking was that it is a game that like while every individual like conversation is crafted it's totally non-linear it's like it yeah. could be more nonlinear in terms of like, like again, you don't even have to talk to anybody, I'll, I'll, so it has I'll, to account I'll, for I'll all argue this with stuff. There, I uh, will argue with the the, the linearity. Or, I, I feel linearity yeah. in that um, it comes through the sequence of events that the yes. player experiences, and that's where it lives, right? It's it's uh, I fought Meg, and then and then she's there, and then we have this interaction, and then yeah. next time I'm there, I'm expecting her, and no, it's changed. Um, and that's that's where the linearity comes from, but it's not right. linear like you've laid the railroad down. It's the path I'm walking, and that's where that line is. Yeah, that's that, that's no that that's definitely correct. Like the um, you know the the actual like the main storyline is 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 highly linear. Like when you when you clear the game successfully, there's a the the progression there with with a few small exceptions is is, is essentially like a crafted story, but. Um, like the order in which certain things happen um, can be really can be well beyond our control because we don't know which characters you're going to talk to in what order. Like l like an example is we have um, the characters of Orpheus and Eurydice. Mm -hmm. and these are both optional characters, and you can meet them in any order. And so we have to account for, and they have a whole like big storyline between them. So we have to account for which character you meet first how much you talk to them and like the gap of time you know between you talking to them and you talking to the other and basically make a coherent entry point into that story based on that information so it's kind of a i've described it as kind of like a reverse uh, funnel type of structure where in a lot of like branching narratives it starts from like a fixed point and then you know the 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 permutations branch out as you make mm -hmm. decisions in in hades it's a bit more the reverse where your entry point into certain storylines can be highly non-linear based on the game state and then it resolves to like a more linear uh resolution uh but like um th the part where you know it's so like player driven in terms of engagement and like the and the randomness being a big factor we we felt like similar to pyre that you know some people may have a great experience with this but others really might not like maybe the randomness just really makes odd stuff happen and it just kind of doesn't come together for people but um i think i think the the like the sense of player agency that the kind of like the res the the way that the game is responsive to the player kind of makes up for um that aspect um and and it's been a really pleasant surprise because it felt like we yeah it felt like we gave up a lot of control in making like a highly random game that still has a story component to it but but um it yeah, I, I think as to your point, it's like it's the power. It's why we want to create stories in games and not write screenplays or books or whatever. Maybe yeah. you want to do that stuff too, but the unique part, uh, like like the interactivity and the player interaction, is like what makes stories and games like have their unique property. So yeah, I I always want to keep exploring what that means uh, as part of it as well, um, and 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 do stuff that does feel kind of at that at that at that edge where it feels like we're giving up you know mm -hmm. finding that sweet spot between like authored characters but also really highly player driven uh stories because i i think there's a lot of debating that it's kind of one or the other you know no player story is the ultimate thing i you know dwarf fortress that's like the hmm. not to you know so, some players feel strongly that 
like player story is the ultimate story and then on on the other hand you, you know there's there's like Let's naughty dog scouting. games or something <laughs> yeah, yeah games that are like like meticulously crafted yeah. um you know but but more cinematic experiences and our feeling is like there's a sweet spot sort of in the middle there too where it could it could have the benefits of authored characters mm -hmm. and authored storylines but um but feel highly like reactive uh, to the player and feel feel very personal as a result and that that sense of it feeling personal i think is really when you play a game that feels personal in that way like it like you had a unique experience that only you had like that's such a special feeling uh, that games uh, can sometimes provide mm -hmm. so i think we we kind of shoot for that I'll agree with you 100%. You know, to at the end of the day, two authors, the the, the developer and the uh, player, always, better than one. <laughs> yeah. If, if, when exactly. it's well yeah. done, it's absolutely well, well said. Um, yeah. The actually, it's funny. The, the, the chat is, is is popping off. They really appreciate you coming on. Uh, I appreciate Thanks. you coming on. Um, is there anything you want to share with people? You got any other uh, side projects in, in the go? Uh, just, just chilling after launch and nah, yeah. I, 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 you know, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm both. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to get to work on stuff I care about at Super Giant, but I never, I, I've never really had side. I've never really given myself enough. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm hesitating because it just sounds like excuse making. I don't have any side projects. I kind of gave, I gave this game, uh, I gave this game my damnedest and it kind of, you, you know how it is with writing. It's like, you love it, but it, or maybe for me personally, at least it feels like it's almost like exorcism, like, like, I, like out demons be gone. Uh, it's, it's like, it's a, it's an important feeling. It's like, can be a cathartic feeling, but it's not always, you know, it can be kind of grueling as well. Like it's not purely like most writers won't tell you like, ah, there's nothing more joyous than writing. Like it can feel kind of excruciating at times as well. Uh, but, but it's really, um, if you have that, if you have that thing in you where you have to write, then you know what it's like. And it felt good to kind of get the stuff out of my system with this game. But as soon as I finish a project, I, I want to jump right into the next thing. That's my thing. Um, I, I actually remember it's, my my colleagues are like <laughs> we need to chill and i and i agree with them they're right but i can't stop my brain from from churning and i just you know want to develop more of these voices and so on so i'm excited to hopefully have another shot at doing this kind of stuff uh, before too long but i at, at the moment i'm anxiously wondering what that opportunity will be exactly because we have to decide that together and uh, we we make these decisions together and through our collective decision making we arrive at the best decision but it's not always the decision that like anyone you know like, like i don't know that any of the games we've made would have been the game that i personally would have made if i could have just made anything in the world right like they're as i said they're like the confluence of all of our abilities and interests and stuff like that so i'm just curious to see what we end up doing next um and excited to find that out but yeah for now i uh, we we definitely uh are due for a break i think we we're still working on um aspects of the game uh, i mentioned before we have our big like cross saves feature and stuff like that but we've been we've been just blown away by by the response and really really just incredibly grateful for the support and I've been heartened to see the game uh, kind of uh, people enjoying the game because we set out to make a game that 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 had like it's our most it's our most uh, light-hearted game um, and we wanted it we wanted it to be kind of sneakily right light-hearted because it looks grim and dark on the surface and it's set in the underworld and all it's this stuff Hades. but like yeah it's called <laughs> Hades but 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 uh but but somewhat secretly it's 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 a more um it's a warmer yeah. story than that. And, and um, it's, and I think it sort of happened in the right place at the right time for some people. And that's, you know, we can't control the circumstances in which our games are released. Uh, so we're, uh, and, and it's, it's weird to realize that the game is like, it, it, it's a, it's strange to think that the game is like benefiting from the freaking pandemic right now or something like you see people, I don't know what to what to make of that, right? Um, but we we were in a fortunate position to be able to keep working despite everything that happened this year, and that motivated us to 
to keep doing our best and I'm just glad people like the result. It, it means that we as a development team will probably have another shot to make something. And like we were talking about before, that's we just kind of want to be able to keep the streak going uh, for as long as we can. So maybe we'll have another shot. That, you better. That's, you better. <laughs> that works for me. The, I, I'm, I'm glad you I'm glad y'all are feeling the love. Uh, I want, the chat wants you to know that they've been waiting weeks for this episode. <laughs> they oh. have they have gotten out of bed at 2 a.m. Some of them to 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 witness you. Um, Thank you. They Th thanks so much. They they really appreciate the game, and we really appreciate your time. And I I've seen I've seen it slowly get darker and darker around you. <laughs> as the, it is. As, yeah. What is the, this? The, I should turn some light on. It's uh, it's that it's much, daylight much, savings. <laughs> yeah, much more in theme now. It's like a. Yeah, the underworld. Is I didn't. Gone. I didn't notice that. Yeah, I'm. I'm shrouded in darkness, but it's not. It's not so late here. Everybody. Um, yeah. Th thank. Thanks. Thanks to you all for, uh, for tuning in and yeah, fo following following along with this thing and yeah, for playing. I mean, I, d I don't think I need to, uh, but I will be dropping the links for Hades if you guys have not uh, grabbed uh, a copy and given it a swing yourself. Please, by all means, go check out the game. You all know you're gonna love it. You all already do love it um and uh greg it's been a wonder catching up with you it's so good to Thanks. talk writer to writer it's so great to hear all of the details about how the studio has grown i've i've again we were talking a bit about uh you know from the early days bastion single booth at a pax is when i first met you guys and y'all have grown so big and strong and i'm so proud of you guys. <laughs> there you go into the light um, yeah, no, th thank you. Thank you. We're just as, 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 as you know, just kind of just getting by in the, the game industry is, it can be a rough place to kind of keep going in. Um, it, it's a, the moment you feel remotely competent at what you're doing, like the whole industry changes and you have to learn everything all over again. Um, so it's really hard to, to stay on top of everything, I think at least it is for me. Um, so I just, yeah, try to never let a day go by to where I don't feel gratitude that I'm able to keep doing this work in any capacity. And I, I just want to be able to keep it, keep it going. And I'm, I'm, I'm glad, glad people, people like it because it's what I, it's what I wanted to do since I was a little kid. And if, if I, if it didn't go, I don't know what I'd be doing instead. Um, so it's, it's, it's fortunate that it's been working out. Okay. <laughs> um, and yeah, so thanks a lot for the support. It, it really, it really means a lot. Um, cause day in and day out, Justin, I think, you know, how it goes, you're just kind of, it, it can, it can feel like a, I don't know, at least for me, it can feel like a toil. Like you, you just, especially these days, you're just, you know, I'm just here in my attic basically is just in front of a computer, like nothing it's kind of abstract mm -hmm. um so just uh but we make games because we want to connect with people this is like it, for me it's i can connect with people through games more easily than i can by like having a conversation for better or worse um so this is my way of uh feeling like a human connection so i'm mm -hmm. i'm glad i'm very grateful when whenever it works out yeah <laughs> so. I, I work there it's uh yeah um i i am slowly coming to understand more how um the back and forth with an audience uh can can really lighten that sense of toil and uh i'm i'm glad you guys have found that post launch but i also know you found some of that uh during the early access period as well um the the, the way that development has shifted is uh it, it's a, it's a surprising step and it's one that like um I think you guys handled really, really well. I didn't, I didn't, I didn't play the game in, in early access. I waited until the 1.0, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, it's a, it's something that, that seeing more developers do it right is, uh, is valuable. Not just, yeah. not just for me as a creator looking for good examples to follow, but for the industry as a whole that yeah, getting, we, getting a strong back and forth. We really benefited from, from our predecessors on that um from looking at these games like dead cells uh that that we've you, you know from our point of view uh, having played them in early access it's like wow they you know they it was a great game you know from the moment it entered early access and just kind of got better and better and they the team seemed so 
receptive to feedback and all this stuff. So we we drew a lot of inspiration from from games that came before us and just yeah tried to try to frame the relationship correctly with with our early access players. Just try to provide them with the clarity that we would have wanted in their place. Um, and early access, uh, to be clear, it's a big it, it it was it was hard like it it um it quickened the pace of development uh, there was kind of never a dull moment never really a sense of downtime um but um it it helped us stay really focused on the aspects of the game that mattered and there like I, I we can't argue with the result either like our team grew um and we brought some really talented people on board and you know as like we we have I, I work with really talented people as well, but the degree to which Hades has like surpassed our previous games, like in in kind of measure, measurable ways or whatever, whether it's like critical reception or 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 just the the audience um, so far after 1.0, it it I can attribute it, we have to attribute a large amount of that to the early access process itself. That's like one of the really big things that was. Um, yeah, we planned the game, we developed it in early access, and we grew the team. Like those were the factors that led to Hades doing uh, as well as it has. Like because because the seven of us who worked on all of our previous games, like we're the you know we're just older, <laughs> you, you know. <laughs> like it's not like I I I didn't like wake up one day and become way better at at my job, right? It's like um, the the we we've always been kind of known quantities in some ways but yeah so early access is really um worthwhile um but it's like it it, it uh it's it's good it's good to like it's good that we've ended that process for now as well because it, it definitely uh is intense and i'm glad that mm -hmm. we have uh, the character of sisyphus in our game uh, because we have uh he was kind of it was nice to have sisyphus to 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 look to you know during early access because the moment you finish one one big update it's it's time for the next one and so on so good old upbeat sisyphus uh helped helped me through that some of the time <laughs> sisyphus is also in my game <laughs> oh yeah <laughs> he's a, a great character he's a he's a really fascinating character yeah um well i think uh we get we better better get a move on and go push our own boulders uh, yes continue i mean i think you, you i think you've deserved a little bit of a break but uh i know i have to keep pushing mine um gang one th throw some more thanks in the chat uh this was such a good conversation we've been looking forward to it for so long um not just to, to hear the insights uh, of super giant and hades but but to catch up and and have a nice yeah, heart to heart for a little while. it's been it's been it's been a while um uh i will be back uh th oh god this this weekend um i'm doing the 24-hour game jam uh so enjoy uh that you guys and um Love we'll it. say thanks to to greg and uh i guess goodbye for now um yeah cheers Keep folks uh, they, they they love you so much <laughs> okay i'm gonna throw it on the thanks for watching and i'll send you guys away to somewhere wonderful on twitch um cheers take it easy <laughs>